Sirius XM, the satellite radio giant, has announced a plan to buy Pandora, the streaming music pioneer, for three and a half billion dollars. So what does it mean for the future of content and subscriptions online and a big week in cloud computing? I was in Orlando on Monday and sat down for one triple play interview with the CEOs of Microsoft, Adobe and SAP. They've got a big idea for collaboration in the cloud that they call the Open Data Initiative. So why does that matter? To the rest of us, well, it's got some implications for this whole debate over who really owns your data. I'm John Ford from CNBC. Welcome to Fort Knox, rich ideas and powerful people. We're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Apple TV, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Fire TV, Spotify. Where aren't we? That's just to name a few. Joining me this week is Pandora co-founder Tim Westergren, who I imagine has some mixed feelings right now, seeing his baby engaged to a satellite radio company. Tim, welcome. Good morning. <laughs> Good to yeah. see you. So. Is this a good thing, Tim? Yeah, it is. Look, I think uh, this combination is, has a lot of potential for sure, and it's kind of been obvious for a little while. I think you know, Greg and Jim have the long view here, and you put together a bunch of really interesting pieces with this combination. You've got you know, Pandora, which has this massive engaged user base, which has dominated sort of free radio and is joining subscriptions, with a company that's got uh, obviously a huge foothold in cars, that is intimately connected to the live business and that is an expert in subscriptions. And that's a very potent ecosystem, so I think uh, a lot can be done with this combination for sure. Now, I had the current Pandora CEO, Roger Lynch, on Fort Knox not long ago, asked him about Pandora's outlook and, and what assets it really has. Take a listen to what he had to say. Radio in the U.S. is bigger than streaming. Whether you look at the revenue from advertising, which is about $15 billion a year, or just the number of listeners. And so radio is, you know, an old technology, broadcast. Why, why is that? I mean, all, smartphones are deeply penetrated. Yeah. People could stream yeah. radio-like experiences, and they do, but more people could if they wanted to. Is it the DJs? Is it the personalities? Is I, it I think it's a number of factors. What? I think it's, it's convenience is the most significant factor. Radio is really easy. Most radio is consumed in a car. If you think about it, you get in your car, you're driving, you press the on button on your radio, it's as simple as that. You have your presets of your stations. So what I always tell our team at, at Pandora is, we have to make Pandora as easy to use in the automobile as pressing the on button of your FM radio. And the other thing we need to do is expand our content offer because even though the majority of radio listening is music, there's still about 28% of listening that is non-music. And if you think Did about- I podcasts? Yes. I know a good one. Yeah, I know a good one, too. <laughs> I've heard you might have a good podcast. <laughs> so we're expanding in, in, in podcasts, but, you know, you can think about podcasts as really containers for other content, whether it's news or sports or, uh, you know, other information. So, you know, at Pandora, we're building um, a what we call the podcast genome, which is a capability to present in a highly personalized way, like we do for music, spoken word content that can be intermingled with your music. And we think that's one of the steps in addition to making Pandora as easy to use as pressing the on button on your FM radio that will really help us uh, penetrate radio listening in the automobile, which is the dominant place where people listen to radio. So, Tim, as a consumer, I'm, I've, I've got a dog in this fight here, because I have been a Sirius XM subscriber for years, pay them a lot of money. I also use Pandora. Uh, so, on the one hand, Sirius XM's app experience on the phone is not so hot. On the other hand, Pandora, as you well know, has struggled to really build a subscriber base. So, when you put these yeah. two together, what do you get? Well, first I'll say I think, you know, Roger's dead on. Uh, and I've kind of been saying this for a while, too, as have a lot of people, that, you know, what makes radio so popular and so enduring is its ease of use. And music is primarily an activity you do while you're doing something else, in some cases driving or working, you name it. So it's really about background music. Most people want to sort of start it and then leave it alone. But the task of making something that easy to use and completely personalized is fantastically difficult, and I think Pandora is the best at it. You know, the sort of lean back listening Pandora has nailed and gets better and better with each passing month and year. Uh, I think you're right, you know, we relate to get into subscriptions for a handful of reasons, and I think that's part of what makes this combination compelling. You've got a company that has been focused on that for a long, long time that brings a lot of expertise and, of course, resources. And, you know, as I look back at the sort of trajectory of Pandora, one thing that has been common for Pandora this entire time is it's been very under-resourced. I mean, we did a lot with very little. 
we left a lot of things on the table when we were looking at kind of our prioritization process every quarter. I mean, it was maddening. We have a you know, list of things to do in our, my, as long as my arm. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when you put the resources against this at Pandora that its rivals have had for so long. So uh, a lot of potential can be unlocked with that. So you're not on the board anymore, so you can spitball this with me. Yeah. Uh, do you think that Sirius XM should give Pandora Premium for free to subscribers? Because as it is right now, Pandora Premium is more affordable than Sirius XM itself. It seems like a natural sweetener. Well, so I, it's hard for me to answer that, not knowing all the intricacies of Sirius XM's business. But what I'll say is this. I think the winner in music is not the one that gets the most $10 a month subscribers. That really? is not the I do not, I do not believe that. I think the winner is the one that serves the entire demand curve so that can meet people where they are. So people that want it for free, that are willing to tolerate advertising, people that will pay some mid price, that will pay sort of a la carte, and folks that want kind of the, the full Monty at 10, 12 bucks a month. No, but wait a second, Tim. Want. If you've got the most $10 a month subscribers, can't you do all that other stuff if you want to? I mean, isn't that the hardest thing? That's funny. I think it's not. It's the easiest thing. I think, <laughs> you know, the, the on demand product is a complete commodity. It's making a bunch of digital music available whenever you want it. It is the same across all services. That's a generic product. The personalized radio listening experience is the opposite. That requires an immense amount of intellectual property, and product development takes years to build so that when you launch a station, it works for you song after song. And remember, consumers are very unforgiving if you play the wrong song for them. And we've learned that, I, mean, I learned that in spades over the years at Pandora. So I think this now gives SiriusXM a huge leg up because it now has the best lean back experience to marry to these more premium products and I think be able to serve Interestingly, not just the full demand curve in terms of uh, listening, but also use cases because you've got live alongside it now. So that's, there's lots to be done there. And we not talk with Mike Rapino off and on, on again for many years about how we could partner with Live Nation. I hope and I'll expect to see something there too. All right. Well, this is Fort Knox. I am John Fort at CNBC. And joining me is Tim Westergren, the founder, co-founder of Pandora, which uh, just announced that it's going to be acquired for three and a half billion dollars, acquired by Sirius XM. And, uh, you know, as is the tradition, when two kids get engaged, they go to see the parents and the parents break out the photo album and break out the baby picture. So, Tim, let's go back and talk about the origins of Pandora. It's an appropriate time. Um, where were you? What were you doing when you and your co-founders came up with this idea that so many of us take for granted now? Well, I was a struggling musician, and I played in rock bands for a while. I was a film composer for some time, so I was kind of in and among all those folks trying to make a living at it. And really, the, the original inspiration for this company came from that experience. It was, you know, how do you surface all this great music that I saw all around me uh, and make it available and allow it to find its audience. And, and back then, in the early aughts, you know, the, the web had just hit. And all of us musicians were looking around saying, oh, man, you know, salvation has come. We are all now going to have global distribution and huge audiences. And, <laughs> and you know, it, it, it's a new era. Lo and behold, nothing really changed. You know, it was kind of a new version of retail where, you know, arguably with a much smaller kind of square footage to look at the catalog. So it wasn't solving that discovery problem. That's what this is all about. You know, how do you surface musicians and you know, art that, that people just weren't finding? And along those lines, you came up with something that maybe some Pandora listeners know a bit about, but probably a lot don't, the Music Genome Project. At what stage of the development of Pandora did that become an idea, and how did you figure out what your method was going to be for putting that together. Yeah, so that was the original idea way back when, 19, end of 1999. And, and it actually grew out of my experience as a film composer, where I spent my time trying to understand music taste, essentially, trying to sort of please a film director. And I would play songs for them. And, and based on their feedback, I'd translate that into sort of a taxonomy of their taste. Something I kind of I could kind of understand and use to compose a new piece of music. So it's almost like and looking so at an of, animal out in the wild, right? You say, okay, its nose looks like exactly. this. It has fur, or exactly. it has wings, or doesn't have wings. Does it have gills or not? <laughs> exactly. You're looking at music this way. Exactly. I mean, you know, I you you know, I, I came to the Pandora office with you yeah, and, and you looked through it. exactly how you guys code the stuff in. Um, w what are some examples of the ways you, you break down a given song uh, and say that it is or isn't like another song? So there are a range of attributes. That are well over 400, 
that describes sort of every aspect of a song, melody, harmony, rhythm, form, text, instrumentation, you name it. So there are obvious ones like tempo, you know, how fast or slow is a song. And then there are much more sort of nuanced things like how much use of chromatic harmony. That may be something that a listener doesn't even know or understand, know what that means, but it actually may be something they're responding to, uh, not knowing it. So we have had musicians uh, spending you know, six, eight hours a day listening to songs one at a time, 20, 30 minutes a song or more to, to capture this sort of fingerprint. And that's, the, that's really the engine behind playlist creation at Pandora, to which you add thumbs. Huh. Well, we have had another guest on Fort Knox who knows a thing or two about music. One of my favorites, Q-Tip, the abstract of A Tribe Called Quest. Uh, I asked him about, really, what he sees as the differences between all these platforms. He's got a show, Abstract Radio, on Apple Music. His friend Questlove has a deal with Pandora. Mm -hmm. Here's a bit of our conversation. I think the way you tell is through content. Um... And I guess, you know, innovation in, in, in marketing, in innovation in, you know, how they message, mm -hmm. and um, specificities in their marketing and how they message. But it's ultimately content. Content, like what are you telling content, Eddie Q content, and Jimmy Iovine content, about, content. here's where you need to get to <clears throat> You know, Apple talks that they all talk about being good for artists, but where you really need to get to in order to reach some of those issues you were just talking about, about, you know, being... For them, really, it's about market share. It's about consumption. It's about having the most mm -hmm. to be the biggest because, you know, when, you, when you're a conglomerate in that way, you know, you kind of become, like, I don't know if you're into... Uh, into comics, but I am. Mm -hmm. But you become Galactus. Yeah. And Galactus was the one who would Going swallow around, worlds. Eating worlds. That's all he did was swallow worlds. Can somebody be Silver Surfer? And see, Silver <laughs> Surfer, that's, that's where you, and that's where I believe Jay-Z is Silver Surfer, and Questlove is Silver Surfer, and I could be Silver Surfer. Mm. You know, you have to, instead of, uh, airing complaints and stuff like that, you have to you have to kind of see it from both sides. You mm. have to put yourself in their shoes, right? So I understand that in order for Galactus to survive, his practical need is to eat worlds. <laughs> in order for, for Norman Rad or Silver Surfer to save his world, he says, look, I love my dear world of peace so much. I have these, I'll do, I'll go out and get other ones, but leave this one alone. Mm. So I understand Norman Rad's position, and you're dealing with something that's just kind of a one dimension you have to consume, because if they don't have market share, then they fall. Now, Tim, I bet you didn't expect that Q-Tip was gonna go there. <laughs> he went Galactus <laughs> on the music industry. Do you agree? Yeah, well, let me, before I say something, I say one of the, my proudest moments at Pandora was when Quest came to see us, and uh, he had met with the, the BD team. They were going to do a partnership, and we were walking out. I said, hey, Quest, come with me for a second. We went downstairs and went over to where the music analysts were doing the analysis, and we sat down, and I, sh I walked him through an, an, an analysis, and, like, light bulb went off in his head. He said, oh, uh. man, like, this is what I use to program my <laughs> stations, man. Like, this is how I do it, like, relative minors and majors. Like, you know, it was a great moment of here's this, like, you know, extraordinary musician, a true intellectual, looking at it and saying, like, yeah, that's the way he should be doing it. Anyways, yeah, I agree with Q-Tip. I mean, the nature of the industry is, you know, bigger is better, and uh, there's obviously a business to be had there, but I think the potential of the web is, is to do something much more distributed. You know, done right, sort of every audience, every, art, sorry, every artist should find, be connected to its, its proper audience, an efficient market. That requires a really smart means of connecting the two, and that's really the, what the genesis of Pandora was way back when and, and remains to this day. So um, what's your role in this business now? I mean, once a musician, always a musician. Once a creative, always a creative. What are you noodling with or, or pushing on, and what do you hope happens? Yeah, well, 
I, f I feel like my work isn't finished, uh, for sure. I think the piece that we were working on, but you know, really, as a, a, for lack of resources, couldn't invest in it the way we wanted to, was how do you turn all of this consumption online, uh, all this participation, into sort of financial viability for artists? And I think it's one of the it's kind of the elephant in the room right now for the business. That yes, it's growing, but you ask a musician what life is like right now. I think a lot of them would say, "I wish we were 20, 30 years ago." Still. I mean, there are some that are profiting immensely that have kind of caught the wave, the digital wave, but most musicians aren't. And A few, right? And, Drake? Yeah, yeah. Mostly Drake? <laughs> yeah, look, it's the, the rich get richer, you know, unfortunately. Um, but I think there's, uh, there is an opportunity here, and this is where a lot of my headspace is right now, and how do you, how do you just allow artists to participate, frankly, in the, in the value they're driving? Um, so I'm spending a lot of time thinking about that and, and ha have an itch to, to, so, to solve that problem. And I'm making music again. I'm at the piano and, 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 and recording, so it's nice to be back doing that again. And, of course, watching Pandora with, uh, with great interest every day, rooting for him. Nice. Well, Tim, I want you to take a hard left turn with me. But I'm going to connect these two things. We're about to talk a little <laughs> enterprise technology, because it, and the link is data, because we were talking about um, uh, artists and how they can get the most out of their creative efforts. I was just in Orlando uh, earlier this week, and uh, I sat down with the CEOs of Microsoft, Adobe, and SAP. They are starting something that they call the Open Data Initiative, and the idea behind this is, right now, uh, a company's data can live in a whole bunch of different clouds. You could have some in Microsoft's cloud, and Dynamics, and Azure. You could have some more creative assets in Adobe's cloud, you know, your internal systems data in SAP's cloud. And their idea is, if this data really belongs to the customer, the customer ought to be able to take all of it, put it together, run analysis on it, and get smarter. Because after all, that's what the likes of, I don't know, Google, Amazon are doing with the data in their clouds. Sometimes they can get smarter off of a customer's data than the customer can get themselves. Does that kind of idea, Tim, you think resonate? Because right now we're talking about this not only in the context of companies and what they can do with their data, but we're talking about who owns a consumer's data and how much value are they going to get out of it, whether it's being collected by uh, a music streaming service or an e-commerce service or a search engine. What do you think? I think it's really interesting. I'll sort of take it a step further, maybe, and say that uh, why wouldn't a consumer who is, who is generating um, data for a company that drives revenue participate in the revenue? So if you are you know, a, a, a member of a social network, a member of any kind of service where your, your time and attention and information is flowing into that service, that is translated by that service into revenue, why don't you participate in it? And I think. I think we will evolve over time to where consumers essentially, uh, you bid on consumers so that you know, where you go to invest your time and attention and data and value uh, is reciprocated. So there's sort of an auction in a sense for consumers, which place you go to that will be the most rewarding for you individually. And I think that will kind of turn on its head the current uh, kind of um, arrangement, which is, one, which is a one-way street. Uh, so I think that will happen, and I certainly, that's part of my thinking in the context of artists. You know, how do you make that, how do you catalyze that for artists who are creating an enormous amount of value? It's, it's quite extraordinary. I'm, I'm not just talking about artists making, what, 10, 15 percent of the business revenue right now. It's mm -hmm. over a lifetime, over the lifetime, you think about all of us, how we consume music, the role it plays in our lives. Artists are really not compensated commensurately, you know, frankly. Uh, sure. with the value they create for consumers over time. Like, how do you narrow that gap? And I think data is a big part of that. Uh, indeed it is. And let's listen to a little bit. It gets a little corporate here, but these are three CEOs of companies that combined are worth nearly $1.2 trillion, talking about the importance, they say, of a new idea they've got about data. Here's Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella, Adobe CEO Shantanu Narayan, and SAP CEO Bill McDermott. Here's what they have to I've say. I've never seen anything quite like this, frankly, and I've been doing this on air and, uh, and in print for a while. More than a trillion dollars worth of market cap represented by you three gentlemen sitting here, and you're announcing the open data initiative in the cloud. Satya, why is this so important? You know, the insight that all three of us had 
based on the work we're doing with many customers, you know, we talked about Coca-Cola, Unilever, Walmart today as customers are all excited about this open data initiative. It's their real uh, insight that led us to do this, which is how do we work to put them in control of their own customer data? Because that's the real currency. Any brand out there cares deeply about their continuous improvement of their own customer data's understanding. Mm -hmm. And the three of us coming together is going to be central to them feeling in control of their own customer data. And the idea being Microsoft with Azure Dynamics, you've got a certain set of customer data. Uh, Adobe, you've got the experience cloud, you've got lots of marketing data, different types of data about the customer and how uh, companies are trying to reach out to the customer. SAP, you've got lots of data too, a, a lot of it having to do with what's going on inside the company that's affecting customers outside as well. So, what are customers going to be able to do, and maybe Bill, I'll, I'll toss this one to you, that they couldn't do before once you figure out this open data thing and they're able to read data across right. all of your platforms? John, there isn't a CEO in the world that does not want to have a single view of their customer. And they have to connect their demand chain to their supply chain mm -hmm. and do so in real time. So if you think about the consumer who's social, mobile, they're geospatial, they're always on the fly. They're gonna shop different companies in all channels, direct to consumer, wholesale, retail, and you have to make sure that connection point with that consumer is really intimate. So these companies need to be intelligent enterprises because more and more AI and predictive analytics is gonna rule in how you engage with that customer, but ultimately what you have to do is fulfill. So now you're gonna see the demand and the supply chain completely integrated and that data will be shared evenly among our companies so the customer is the major benefactor of the open data initiative we announced today. John, if I may add to that for a second, I mean what we have already demonstrated uh, by having a common taxonomy for this customer journey. Meaning but, what? Uh, meaning how you define a customer, how you define the demographics, how you define the lifetime value, how you define their interests. We have actually agreed across the companies, despite the fact that we have some overlapping yeah. products in that space, I think demonstrates our commitment to uh, this open data initiative. And the fact that you have customers who are excited about building on top of the foundation that we have, I think gives us a lot of confidence that this is the right thing for enterprises. It's like a corporate genome project, Tim. Did you hear that? They've already agreed on the taxonomy across all their clouds. Does that warm your heart? Yeah, of course. They're finally ca ca catching up to us. You know, uh, Ashley, this does. It, this kind of reminds me again. You know, part of what makes Pandora so valuable as an entity is the amount of data that it collects. You know, there is no service as engaging as Pandora that, that, that prompts or elicits so much feedback from listeners in the form of these thumbs. And the information you're gleaning right now, it's being leveraged to build an efficient advertising business. But you know, I think that Apple, Amazon, Google are going to rue the day they let this uh, Pandora get away from them. Because I think this company is a, can, is a cor can be the cornerstone for a global uh, play in music uh, unlike any other. Because it, it is, it, if you remember, Pandora grew to almost 100 million registered listeners in the US alone with barely a dime of marketing. Mm. You know, it was an utterly viral phenomenon. And, you know, I witnessed firsthand the passion, that connection between uh, Pandora and its listeners. If you remember, I used to do town halls across the country, meeting people in person, actually. And I saw what was going on between listeners and Pandora. I think anybody who had witnessed that would understand kind of how vast the potential is. And I, you know, I, I hope that this combination can realize it, but boy, uh, this company could do an awful lot too in the hands of, of a global and you know uh, partner the likes of you know uh, Apple Google etc so um, a few comments from the audience here hot jet set says is my Sirius XM subscription gonna decrease that's all I want to know hot jet set I can pretty much authoritatively tell you no not gonna happen that's that's just me as a subscriber I don't have any inside information from the company but as somebody who's subscribed a few years I don't think that's gonna happen uh, also says I listen to it in my house on my bows uh, Thomas Suras says people only get serious with a new car then they never renew I don't know 
Mm. Hot Jet said, and I seem to be on the hook. And then Lead Primor says, uh, your subscription fee is tied to the wholesale cost of Howard Stern's beauty and health. Um, a little bit on the uh, Sirius XM business model there. Uh, Tim, final thoughts on this. You gave a good summary there uh, on the value of Pandora, but where do you think we're going to be five years from now in terms of, I don't know, Amazon, Apple, Google? Now you've got Sirius XM Pandora very much in this game across the whole music on demand spectrum. What's going to determine who wins? You still say not the player with the most $10 a month mm, subscribers? Correct, yeah. So I guess I'll think about, I'll answer that in two parts. So from the standpoint of the consumer, I think that uh, the, I think the $10, $12 a month subscription um, it will reach a ceiling. And the market's going to really start to rationalize that. I, I think that uh, the way people are consuming these services doesn't reflect that value. And I think there's going to be a lot of pressure to diversify the packages, essentially, so you don't have a one-size-fits-all. You're going to have to accommodate consumers that want to pay less or for whom on-demand listening is not their primary form of consumption. And they'll do it for a while. There's novelty to it. But these services experience very high churn still. And so mm -hmm. I think that's going to get rationalized. And I think the, the service that will win is the one that's there to catch, in a sense, all these consumers and provide the service they want for them, whether it's totally free, totally advertising supported, subsidized in some fashion, some modest amount of on demand or fully on demand. It's who can stitch those together in a really elegant way and make it available you know, uh, across consumers. And I think that's where that's going to go. And as I, I, will, I will reiterate that I don't think the most subscribers is the answer. That's a hard business model, by the way. <laughs> no one's making money there yet, let's not forget. And then the second piece, I, the, well, the second piece I think is um, go ahead. is on the artist side, that you know, mm. uh, I think these services and this industry forgets about the artist at its own peril, because you can't build a business, regardless of whether consumers are like it, that does not uh, uh, support the folks who create the content for it. And right now, that's the disequilibrium that we're in as a business. And I think, again, the second part of the equation is. Who can solve this for the artist? Who can provide a value, enough value to the artist that these services make sense for them? Because if you don't do that, you have a fundamental tension that's going to be pulling these apart. And the service that actually weaves them together will have an enormous advantage. And I think actually, again, I know this, uh, I have a sort of somewhat vested interest in saying this given it's my, bu my, my business, but uh, Pandora is unique in that regard. It is the one service that can take a brand new band that no one has ever heard, that has no data driving it to the right place and know exactly where to play it and to who to play it. So it is the discovery platform. It's the one that can actually drive promotions and marketing, which is what these services artists rely on more than anything. So I think those two, those two dynamics are going to be where this war is uh, won and lost in the years ahead, I think. Well, with those two dynamics, I don't know, maybe titles got a shot. Jay-Z, I'm watching you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Fort Knox. Tim Westergren, it was great to have you with us this week. Uh, thanks for being here. You bet. Here. Thanks for having me, John. Good to see you. This has been Fort Knox, Rich Ideas and Powerful People. I am John Fort here at CNBC headquarters. Uh, see you next time.